Right, well, uh, courtroom dramas are uh, enduringly popular, aren't they, on TV and cinema? And tonight we have a compelling courtroom drama in Micah chapter 6, where God is taking his own people to court. And not just a, a small court, uh, away from the cameras. This is going to be in front of the watching world. Verse 2. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. Now, the mountains and the hills had long been witnesses of God's dealings with his people. They're part of God's creation after all. So we uh, remember when God gave his law to Moses, it was on Mount Sinai. When he made his covenant with Israel, it was in the backdrop of this awesome mountain. And if you remember in Luke 19, in the light of the Pharisees' unbelief, Jesus says, if everyone else is silent and everybody else won't hail God's anointed king, the very stones would cry out. And so it's before these magnificent silent witnesses that we have God, the plaintiff, and we have Israel, the accused, in the dock. It's a momentous occasion. It's no wonder that the chapter starts, listen to what the Lord says. Now, that's how each new sermon or oracle of Micah starts, with a, a call to hear or to listen. Scholars believe that these particular words in verse 1 are a, a later editorial addition to the original prophecy. We don't know that for sure. But it's as if the editor, who is writing down Micah's sermons many years later, is very aware of the gravity of what he's recording. And he's also aware that he's not just talking to Israel, he anticipates many, many more hearing these words in the future, including us. So in a sense, he's talking to us. Listen up, says the editor to us. This is important. Now, I'm going to take this chapter in four parts because I think there were four basic parts to this court case. And the first little section is in verses three to five. And it's not how you might think that court proceedings would start. We've just been told in verse 2, that the, that the Lord has a case against his people. He's lodging a charge against them. They're in breach of covenant. They've committed spiritual adultery. And so you might think, that, well, this is what the Lord will do. He'll just go straight in with a list of accusation and a list of charge. But he doesn't. He starts by making the case for his own faithfulness. The language of verses Three to five here is of the lover pleading with their spouse, or perhaps a, a father pleading with his children. God's heart has been broken. Now, he doesn't need to defend his own behaviour because he's not the one in the dock. You know, he's almighty God. But he wants to awaken these wayward, rebellious people. And so he says, my people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. And it's a, it's a startling th thing to say, isn't it? The, the, the sheer possibility that the loving covenant God might be to blame. That he might have burned his people and caused them to stumble. It's as if the Lord is wanting to grab their attention. And they don't immediately answer. They can't. And their silence is revealing. Because, of course, God is not to blame. They are. The truth was, you see, they were tired of God, not because of him, but because of them. Fidelity to the covenant felt burdensome to them. They wanted to branch out and do as they pleased without God. So God goes on to give them a brief history lesson. And what he does is he focuses in on critical moments in Israel's history. When he first redeemed them out of slavery in Egypt and constituted them as a nation. God hadn't rescued them only to leave them on their own. He'd raised up high caliber godly leadership. Moses, Aaron, Miriam, lawgiver, priest, prophetess. God's ongoing provision for his people to guide them in those formative years. And then a bit later on, when the people were prepared and ready to cross into the promised land, they were facing ungodly opposition in the form of the Moabite king, Balak and the false prophet Balaam who intended to curse Israel so what did God do well wonderfully he turns curse into blessing 
And so Israel are successfully able to cross the River Jordan from Shittim, which is the last stop on the east bank of the Jordan, to Gilgal, which would be the first camp on the west bank. And God leads his people safely across. So you see, from Israel's first redemption, through her wilderness journey, to her final crossing into the land, through many dangers, toils and snares, grace has brought them safely through. Israel had no right to be weary with God. And, and God says in verse 5, remember. Remember my righteous acts. Now why? why? Why does he say that? Well, it's so that in remembering, Israel might be truly thankful to God and return to him with devotion, with thanksgiving. You see, when we're far from the Lord and we're beguiled by the things of the world and we're we're feeling tempted by them and not looking to Christ, what is it that will cause us to stop in our tracks and return to Christ? A list of rules? God scolding us? God guilt tripping us? No. It will be the remembrance of what God has done for us. Looking back at, and remembering where we were before we were saved before he intervened how the covenant god of heaven who left his glory and came down to earth died on a cross for us we remember perhaps his very kind hand of protection when we were first saved and we were very naive and we were very vulnerable and very ignorant of our own sin and our own struggles but he was so gentle and so kind and he he walked with us and he blessed us and he kept us now these are all things that we are apt to forget and we certainly forget them when we're in the grip of sin. Sin is short-termism. Sin is absent-mindedness. Sin doesn't want you to think about what God's done for you in the past. Sin wants to focus on what I want now. And I think God would say to each of us tonight, remember. Remember what I've done for you. Call it to mind. Reflect on it. Consider in the quietness of your heart the many tokens of my love for you. Because you see, it's the remembering that motivates repentance and thanksgiving. You see, I, I think repentance is not something that's negative. It doesn't merely arise from a guilty conscience or from fear of punishment. Because really, that's no better, is it, than a child saying sorry only because they're afraid of the punishment. Repentance is to change our mind about our sin, but also about God. And it's to be dazzled by God's grace and his goodness and his love. I think that's one of the many reasons why we meet around the Lord's table, because it's, it stimulates our memories and it helps us to remember who the Lord is and what he's done for us. And that's part one of this case, the Lord's own defence of his character, his track record, his faithfulness. And he says to Israel, consider me remember me now the second part is in verses six to seven and like the first part this part starts with a question too with what shall i come before the lord and bow down before the exalted god now the book of micah is a, a collection of sermons preached presumably over many years by the prophet and and the key thing is they were preached they weren't originally written down and then read out. This was real preaching from the heart. And you can imagine when this was first preached, perhaps the Israelites on the street corners of Jerusalem going about their business. And Micah is standing there and preaching his heart out. And he's just told them, you've broken the covenant and you're summoned by God to court. You're in trouble. And they've listened with complete surprise as God hasn't rattled off a list of crimes that they committed, but instead has talked about his righteous acts of deliverance. And it's touched their hearts and they realise perhaps we do need to return to this God. But how? That's the question. And naturally these are very religious people. Only it's not the religion of Jehovah. No, the religion that they know is money. 
Money is what makes the world go round in those parts. Everything has its price. Everyone has their price. And so these people naturally think, well, perhaps we can buy this God off. Purchase his forgiveness and his affection and atone for our own sins. But what with? And there's some vague vestige of memory from the past. Religious offerings. We used to come with burnt offerings. So what about a quality offering like a one-year-old calf? Or perhaps we could up the game and we could uh, bring thousands of rams with 10,000 rivers of oil. Now back in the height of Israel's glory, we're told that King Solomon at the dedication of the temple offered 22,000 cattle and 120 sheep and goats. And such is the affluence and, and the materialism in Judah at that time that people are starting to think in such terms. Perhaps we could even rival Solomon. And then perhaps some of the slightly more thoughtful of them remember an event from the dawn of Israel's past. They remember that God had asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son. And they think, well, perhaps that's what's required on this occasion. Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Surely that's the costliest sacrifice a person could ever give, as appalling as it was. And the Israelites perhaps wonder, is that what's going to be asked for? You know, will that be enough for you, God? They're very sad verses, for they demonstrate how far God's people have fallen, how ignorant they are of their own sin, and how ignorant they are of God. Because if they had truly known who God was, they'd understood his holiness, and they'd seen the extent of their own depravity, they wouldn't have dared to ask these kinds of questions. But in their ignorance they ask, and in their arrogance, they perceive no need for them to change. No, it's God who has to change. God has to bow to their wishes and allow himself to be bought off. Israel are a self-deceived people. This is works-based religion. What must we do to turn away your wrath, O God? And it's often what we're tempted to offer God, isn't it? Religious works. Perhaps when we do feel conviction within... Well, perhaps we know that we've wandered away from the love of Christ or we've realised perhaps that we've sinned in some way and our first in instinct is to offer up our works. I'd better read my, my Bible more and attend more church and perhaps I'll increase my standing order to the church. And we don't say it or even necessarily consciously think it but subconsciously the attitude is surely that will be enough to turn away God's anger even though deep down we know full well that our salvation was never based upon our works in the first place, but upon the grace and the mercy of God. Just as Israel had never been delivered from Egypt because they merited it, but because of God's grace. And my point is that religious works, however good and noble and worthy they undoubtedly are, cannot buy off God. Because Isaac Watts says in that well-known hymn, not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain, could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain? And it begs the question, what does God require? As Micah stands there on the street corner and he shakes his head at every fresh offer from the people, they desperately want to know, well, look, if not all our money and all our sacrifices and even our children, what does God require? And then we move into part three of this unfolding drama. Verse 8, where Micah gives the answer. He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Justice, treating people fairly, upholding truth, punishing the wrongdoer. Mercy, having compassion upon those who are poor in debt, the widowed, protecting the vulnerable. The two things, I think, very much go hand in hand. And both, sad to say, were foreign to the people of Jerusalem. Back in chapter 3, verse 1, Micah says, Listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, should you not know justice, you who hate good and love evil? You see, these people were so far gone 
down the path of sin that their morality was totally skewed and they delighted in evil. They hated what was good. And Isaiah, who was preaching to the same people at more or less the same time, he says in Isaiah 5, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isn't that exactly what is happening in our society today? Where what is just and right and merciful and truthful has been sort of flipped on its head and those who have done it are delighted by it. They're delighted by their own wickedness. Now perhaps, perhaps there are people in our society who could plead ignorance, but Judah couldn't. Because as Micah says, these were people who should have already known what was just and good. Why? Well, two reasons. First of all, like every human being, they were created with eternity in their hearts, with God-given consciences, which make clear what is right from wrong. But more importantly, because they were God's covenant people, they'd been given his law, which revealed his character. So they should have remembered that justice and mercy aren't just two things that God quite likes. They're two essential attributes of God's unchanging character. They're part of who he is. And he'd shown them and taught them of himself so that they should have known what was required and how to live. But in their hardness of heart, they were deaf and blind to his requirements. And so Micah has to lay it out for them. What's expected? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And Micah doesn't simply mean, here's a load of stuff that you've got to start doing now. I think the key to that sentence is the second half, to walk humbly with your God. You see, if you're going to truly act justly, and if you're truly going to love mercy, it will stem from your relationship with the God of justice and mercy. There would be no justice and no mercy without this God. This isn't just outward actions, although it's not less than outward actions, but it's more than that. It's the attitude of the heart, the thoughts of the mind. It's the whole person walking in step with God, in sync with God, living a life devoted to God, trusting him, resting in him, worshipping him, serving him, seeking his glory, being conformed to his values and desires. It's basically being able to sing with the hymn writer, you know these words, his forever only his, who the Lord and me shall part. Ah, with what a rest of bliss, Christ can fill the loving heart. Heaven and earth may fade and flee, firstborn light in gloom decline, but while God and I shall be, I am his and he is mine. Now when you're so intertwined with God and so in step with him and in love with his son that he becomes greater and you become less, then you will increasingly live his virtues and serve his interests, not your own. That, isn't that why Micah says it's a humble walk? God on the throne, not me. Giving God first place. So really, the true answer to what does God require is, well, he wants us. He wants our whole hearts. Including every dark corner, every cherished stronghold. He wants our lives, every last part. Not just the parts when we're at church or worshipping with other believers, but all the other bits. Every circumstance, every financial decision. Every relationship choice, every word, every careless word, he wants it all. And that, that's humility, that's the end of self. And it's from that humility and that humble walk that justice and mercy stem. And that's the costliest sacrifice by far that anyone can ever make. Paul says in Romans 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And of course, this was what the people of Judah were never ever willing to do, because far easier to throw some money at the problem, to offer a few sacrifices to God, than to surrender sovereignty of their lives to him. They wanted to avert God's anger, but not at the expense of themselves and their own sovereignty. And Micah knew this, 
After all, he'd been preaching God's oracles for maybe decades. He knew how hardened these people were. And so in part four of this courtroom drama, the judgment of God upon this grace-refusing, God-refusing people must be pronounced, for he is a God of justice. Micah says again in verse 9, Listen, the Lord is calling to the city, and to fear your name is wisdom. Heed the rod and the one who appointed it. Rather like a, a town crier, God himself is going to cry out publicly over the streets of Jerusalem. The people are deaf to his voice. They don't realise that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And they don't realise that even now, as judgment is being pronounced, God is still willing to show mercy. In fact, they don't realise that the voice of the Lord itself is mercy. The pagan nations around didn't have God's voice and they didn't have God's law. But these people did and they had opportunity to repent. This was God's desire for them. Heed the rod and the one who appointed it, says God. He's appointed Assyria as his rod of correction to discipline these wayward children of his. But will they heed it? Now here, finally, having uh, refrained from doing so earlier, the soft-hearted God now reads out the crime list. And it's a pretty horrendous crime list. Judah is a wicked house, verse 10, full of ill-gotten treasures. So dishonest, dishonest business trading was the norm. If you look at verses 10 and 11, they, they speak of the commercial tricks of the trade, where the, the weights and the measures were rigged to cheat those who bought and those who sold. And it was all in the pursuit of money and profit. Because as we've said, money was the God of Jerusalem. The character of these people was rotten. Verse 12, her rich men are violent, her people are liars, and their tongues speak deceitfully. The level of public discourse in Jerusalem is shocking. We might call it today disinformation, fake news. But the God who loves truth says it as it really is. They're liars. There's no truth in them. And God goes on to list the punishment. Verse 13, I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you because of your sins. Now, it's a frightening verse, isn't it? Because it's clear that there can't be any going back in that sense. The process of judgment has already begun. Even now, Judah has lost much of its former glory. Many of Jerusalem's satellite towns have been destroyed and it's only going to get worse. Consider verses 14 and 15. You will eat and not be satisfied. Your stomach will still be empty. You will store up but save nothing. Because what you save, I'll give to the sword. You will plant but not harvest. You'll press olives but not use the oil on yourselves. You'll crush grapes but not drink the wine. Now the language of those verses is very clearly drawn from Deuteronomy 28 where there's a list of Blessings for obedience to the covenant and curses to those who are disobedient to the covenant. Those verses say you'll be cursed in the city, cursed in the country. Your basket, your kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb, the crops of your herds, the lambs of your flocks. This, this is God's word coming to pass. Jerusalem is a cursed city. This is where her rebellion had led her. And it reminds us that sin is self-defeating. Sin always promises great things. It never, ever delivers on them. In fact, it normally produces the opposite result. It's rather like throwing a boomerang, which, because of its curved shape, will come back to you. And, and sin comes back on us. It has an inbuilt futility. It never satisfies. It always comes back to bite a person. And it's part of God's judgment upon us. And it was part of his judgment on Judah. And it's all summed up in verse 16 where the Lord gives the central charge. You have observed the statutes of Omri and all the practices of Ahab's house. Now Omri was the founder and the builder of the city of Samaria. 
up in the northern kingdom. He was an evil, godless man, a military man who had usurped the throne of Israel. And his son Ahab was even more evil than Omri. He had married a foreign queen, Jezebel, and he had brought in the worship of Baal. And it had nearly destroyed two royal families. Now, nobody in Jerusalem would have identified with those two wicked kings. And yet God says, that is the godless tradition you're walking in. Despite your religiosity, despite the temple in your midst, despite the city walls of David's city all around you, you are no better than Omri and Ahab. And your city is going to go the same way as Samaria. Because the people who disobey God and trust in their own counsel will be destroyed. Now the Bible is full of great reversals and some of them are, are, are very encouraging. But this I think is surely the most tragic one. That the people who were meant to be a light to the nations will instead bear the scorn of the nations. That's what's going to happen to Judah. It's a miserable way, isn't it, to end the chapter. A people so hardened by their sin, so committed to the way of evil, that they cannot do what God requires, and thus have been handed over by God to judgment. And yet, even in a dark chapter such as this, there is hope. If religious works, good and noble and worthy though they may be, cannot buy off God, and if these people cannot stop sinning, well then what for sin can atone? And the answer is in verse 8, and it's in the character of God himself. This God of justice and mercy. This God who hates sin, because sin is so opposed to him, and he must deal with sin, and sin must be atoned for, otherwise God would deny himself, and yet he also loves to show mercy. The people had asked, shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression? And that wasn't required, because God had already decided in eternity past to offer his own son for their transgression. The Lamb of God who acted justly and loved mercy and walked humbly with his God. Christ was God's glorious answer to the sins of Judah and to your sins, and to mine. And in heaven's courtroom, we are acquitted. And it's not because of the blood of thousands of rams, but the precious lifeblood of God's Son, who paid for all our sins. And in so doing, God demonstrated his justice, so as to be just, and the one who justifies. Our good works, they can't turn aside God's anger. And they don't need to, because Jesus already has. In wrath, God remembered mercy. And Christ came to receive his Father's wrath in our stead. And we live as very imperfect, and don't we know it, imperfect, yet forgiven sinners. Every sin, past, present, future, atoned for by this God of justice and mercy. And that's the wonder of the gospel. And it's wonderful to us, and we live in its full glare. But even Micah, 700 years before Christ, sees it. And he's amazed by it as well. For he says in the final chapter, which we'll look at next time, Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. What a God we have. What a gospel we hold to. Amen. Amen.